Let me pull up the notes here. I think I probably say this every week, but this is my new favorite of the series. <laughs> wow, I, I tell you, I there are a lot of things stirred inside of me, especially after the week I just had up in Rochester, Minnesota. A lot of things go through your heart and your mind. And sometimes I don't think we filter them very well. We're living in this world that is so noisy and so confused. And it's getting dark out there. And thank God our lights are going to shine brighter in a world that's getting darker and darker. But we need to make sure our lights are shining. We're not under a bushel. That we understand truth. And they don't get it out there. They're looking for it. They think they have it. They think they can create it, but they can't. And we can. Truth is a person. So here, you know, every week, Father Dave takes us to a unique place to set the stage for this week's teaching and the Holy Spirit. And this week, where does he take us? To an empty courtroom. A place where most of us, unless we're lawyers, are a little bit uncomfortable. A lot of legal stuff happens in places like that. And they're trying to get to the truth, the whole truth, right? And nothing but the truth. Here is the opening passage, and I love where he started. Here's the scripture. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples. And they're about to reject what he's going to say. And what did he say? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. How many know if you were one of the disciples that day, you'd be shaking your head too. Three and a half years, Jesus, we heard you. When you whispered in the night, we knew your voice. We watched you do miracles, raise people from the dead. We learned how to pray. We saw you love people that were unlovely. And you're telling us it's to our advantage you're going to go away? No. No. If I do not go away, he goes on, the counselor. We're going to talk about that word there because there are many different aspects of that word in the Greek. The counselor will not come to you. Who's the counselor? The Holy Spirit, right? The counselor will not come. In other words, unless I ascend into heaven, I can't send you my spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. Wow. The word counselor, notice it's capitalized. The Greek word is paraclete. How many have heard that word? Yeah. Paraclete. In the passage Father Dave read, the, the word should be word is advocate from the Dewey Reams Bible actually uses that word, Greek word paraclete. But there's much more to it. I love the Amplified Bible. It's one of the things I still read from the Protestant world. It's not perfect, but it expands Greek words into many different aspects of English words. That I love about it. So here in the Amplified, However, I am telling you nothing but the truth. I like the way they expanded on that. I'm telling you nothing but the truth. What I say is profitable. What does profitable mean? Good, expedient, advantageous to you. For you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, now watch. The comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, the standby will not come to you into close fellowship with you. That's the expanded idea of the Greek. Oh my gosh, that's a whole lot of stuff. It's not just being convicted of the Lord. It's being convinced by God too. Why? Because he's a comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, and he's our standby. 
into close fellowship. He, he says, he will come, he cannot come to you. But, but, but the Amplified Bible says, he cannot come to you and be in close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. Why? To be in close fellowship with you. That is powerful. Powerful. Obviously, Jesus, as both God and man, listen to this, because sometimes we don't think about this. Jesus could not be everywhere at the same time. What limited him? His physical body. He was human. He took humanity. He assumed humanity into himself. And that meant he was limited by that human body while he was on the earth. He couldn't be everywhere at the same time. But the spirit of Jesus has no such limitations. Is it any wonder that the disciples seriously question this? Pentecost had not happened yet. They don't understand what Jesus is saying. They don't even know about the Holy Spirit yet. He hadn't come. It didn't make sense to them. Most of what Jesus told them at the time he said it didn't make sense to them. They had to wait until something happened in fact, a lot of what Jesus taught them made no sense until he was killed on that cross and raised from the dead. And all of a sudden, all the pieces began to come together. It is. You're exactly right. There's not much difference today. All the stuff that happened yesterday that we really didn't see as positive today. We, we now understand. Yeah, absolutely. I'm waiting for the reason and the answer for why I had to have five enemas last week. I'm still praying about that. It's a long story. I'm not going to get into it. This uh, video will be heavily edited. Most of what Jesus told them at the time didn't make sense. The only possible way that that happens for Jesus, his spirit to be everywhere is for the spirit to come on the day of Pentecost and begin to indwell in all the sons and daughters of God. Then Jesus is everywhere. And potentially he can come into the heart of anyone who is willing to let him in and be the savior of their lives. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. Liz's story was amazing, wasn't it? Waking up one morning at the Catholic Youth Ministers Conference and the Holy Spirit making it truly clear to her she needed to get on a plane and go home. Now. Now. How many have had that experience? Several. She obeyed the direction of the Spirit without knowing why. Getting the last seat available on that flight. And then to have a Catholic man sitting to her right, what? Praying the rosary because he overheard what she said. She's sobbing. Sobbing. And he immediately began to, now, how, no, how many of us really understand God did that? He had it all under control. Now, she doesn't tell us what the final result was, but I'm assuming, because she didn't tell us a bad result, that everything came out fine. Spirit of truth. Hmm. Wow. And when he comes, he will convince the world. That's the word convince. Other translations say convict. But the Greek word actually means both. The ampl Here's the Amplified Bible again. He will convict and convince the world. And bring demonstration and bring demonstration to he'll not only convict you of your sin he will convince you that you've sinned and he will even demonstrate it to you 
And when it gets done, you only have one word. Duh. <laughs> right? See, convict, <clears throat> the devil comes and convicts, but what does he do right after he convicts? He condemns. No, no, no. God doesn't do that. God convicts, but he then convinces, and then he demonstrates what damage you've done, not only to the, the body of Christ, but to your own heart because of your sin. Wow. Wow. The Holy Spirit was convicting and convincing and demonstrating to Liz that she had to go home. He wasn't condemning her. She knew down deep she had to get home. And then getting the last lead on that flight and finally that man praying the rosary. Wow. Father Dave put it beautifully. The Holy Spirit convicts in order to convert. That's a great way to say that. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit convicts in order to convert. He wants to bring redemption, restoration, not condemnation. Condemnation comes from the devil alone. We don't have to live with any condemnation. But we need to be convicted and convinced of our sin so we can correct it. When the Spirit convicts us, he is leading us to Jesus. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So when he convicts, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, he's then taking us immediately to Jesus. I love that. Not a condemnation, but a conversion. At this point in the video, Father Dave shows us a painting of the prodigal son. The perfect image. Look at this little chart I found out on the internet. Satan's accusations on the left. That guy's trying to hold up a lot of guilt. And what does Satan bring up to us? Our past sins? A lot of guilt, condemnation, all your failures, all your despair. He is, it's like a video on a loop over and over and over. Do you know how many people are dragging around behind them the last 20 years and they won't let go? Wow. What's on the Holy Spirit conviction side? He's talking about your present sins. He's talking about the grace of God. He's talking about confession and forgiveness and deliverance. Big difference. Big, big difference. The perfect example was the prodigal son. He was convicted and convinced he had to go home, right? He knew if he didn't, he was going to die out there in his sins. He started for home, and you can tell by the words that he was rehearsing to plead with his father to take him back that the devil was hammering on him. Listen to what he said. You can see where the devil got to him. But when he came to himself, how many know, okay, there's conviction. He came to himself. He's feeding pigs, remember? And there wasn't an animal filthier than pigs to a Jewish man. I like ham. They weren't supposed to touch it. I think bacon is made from God. <laughs> right? But for them, now, later on, that would become a clean animal to them because of the vision that St. Peter had. But when he had come to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? But I perish here with hunger. That's his conviction, right? I will arise and go to my father. And listen to what he says. He's going to rehearse this. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. So far, so good. But watch what happens next. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. That's the devil. That is not God. Do you all agree with me? Raise your hands 
raise both hands and say hallelujah. hallelujah. You are now charismatic, okay? <laughs> the devil told him you will be a slave for the rest of your life. You cannot be forgiven. Your father will not forgive you. That's a lie. It's a lie from hell. And he arose, <laughs> here we go. Now we're gonna see what the father is really right, like. And he arose and came to his father. And while he was yet a long distance away, his father saw him, had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Devil, take a hike. Your work is done here. And the grace of God, Took over. What's that? Amen. Amen. And he sees us along. The, see, the minute you turn away from your sin, he's right there. He followed you down that dead end road, by the way. He never abandoned you. You know, a lot of people think, well, I've sinned. Jesus just checked out and went to the Ramada. No, he never left you. He never left you, and he's waiting for that turn. He knows you're damaging your own heart. He knows you're weakening the body of Christ. And he wants to see that turn and then convict and convince and to demonstrate so you don't do it again. That's why. <laughs> I love Casey's spirit. She's so honest. She was saying in her confession, she always confessed her sins. And then she told the priest all the reasons why those sins happen. How many know you don't have to do that? You don't need to make any excuse for your sins. Just confess them. Wow. And the reason she did that was she was waiting for the other shooter drop, knowing the priest was a con con condemn her. And that condemnation never came. Instead, came redemption and mercy. Eventually, she was able, by the convicting and the convincing of the Spirit, to go to confession and just confess her sins. No excuses. And the freedom that she felt in that moment was amazing. Father Dave in the courtroom reminded all of us that the very one who convicts and convinces us of our sins is the same judge behind the bench. He is also our Savior and our Lord Jesus who went to the cross to die for those sins that we are being convicted and convinced of. Boy, you ought to let that settle for a while. That's better than a Snickers bar right there. It is so important for all of us, each one of us this morning, to be convicted and convinced of our sins. Why? So we can confess our sins and then be restored to intimate fellowship with our Father. We need to know so we can go deeper in our faith and not get stuck out in that wilderness for days or months or even years. And it can happen that way. Father Dave tells us that some folks come to confession and here's what they say. Father, forgive me for I have sinned, but I am only human. <laughs> Stop, back up, take out that excuse. Dave makes a strong statement. We cannot use our humanness as an excuse. It's not gonna work. Many times we don't see our sin as personal. It's like breaking the speed limit law and we get a ticket and it's just a speeding ticket. It's nothing personal. Too often we treat the same thing with God's laws. His commandments are like a speeding ticket, it's not personal. But the sad reality is sin is always personal, always. Father Dave puts it, it's not just a law we're breaking, it's a heart we're breaking. Adam and Eve's sin in the garden broke the heart of the Father, and it broke their hearts too. 
We're separating ourselves from the love of God when we sin. We need to start taking our sin personally. That is one of the reasons many Catholics wear a crucifix. We shouldn't be able to look at Jesus on that cross and not remember that it was, he's there because of my sin. And your sin. We put him there. Isaiah prophesied this, the suffering Messiah. The Jews rejected this understanding. They rejected this prophecy, and they do to this day. They're still waiting on Messiah. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. By his stripes, that's when he was whipped with the cat of tails. Every time he got whipped, there were little pieces of sharp rock woven into those leather straps that ripped the flesh off his back. They pulled it off of him and then did it again. 39 times they whipped him for our sins. By his stripes, we are healed. That's what that's saying. Janine's testimony touched my heart. She told us about wanting to help the shelter for homeless women. She got out her checkbook to adopt a homeless woman, and the little old lady helping in the center had some profoundly serious questions for her, convicting and convincing. <laughs> Is this all about the money? You said you wanted to adopt a homeless woman. Do you want to journey with her? Or is this just a Christmas feel good? That's like a kick in the gut to Janine. How many times are we willing to write the check, but we don't really want to get involved? When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own iniquity, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare it to you that the things that are to come. Spirit of truth. The spirit of truth was revealing to Janine what was truly going on in her heart as she tried to write the check but not get involved any further. Wow. Truth for us has become convenient. Truth today out there is your truth is not my truth. I, I will figure out my own truth. How many know that leads to chaos? Suppose, Bill, that I let you decide tomorrow, Bill, exactly what a gallon is to you, whatever that is. How many know Bill may have a tendency to take a 55-gallon barrel and say, that's my gallon, fill her up, right? Or even bigger, I got a truck here, that's a one gallon truck, fill her up. What happens to the world when we let them decide what a gallon is? It goes into chaos. The same thing's happening with the very deep things of our spirits, our souls, our minds. They're going crazy out there. Objective truth seems to be for this world a thing of the past. Thank God it's not for Catholics. Wow. The spirit of truth, Holy Spirit, wants to lead us and guide us into all truth. But in reality, who's he leading us to? Jesus. Jesus said, I am, we said it, the way, the truth, and the life. Wow. That's a foundation we can build our lives on. That's a truth you can rely on every day of your life. And then I love this scripture. I'm going to skip a little bit here so we can have a little discussion. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. You know what that Greek word is, transformed? Metamorphosis. 
butterfly. A worm goes into a cocoon and emerges. How many know all of us were a little wormy in our lives? But the truth of God puts us in this cocoon and he protects us and chemically stuff is happening in there and we emerge, not a worm, but what? A butterfly. Wow. Praise God. We would pray the prayer of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instruct the hearts of your faithful, grant that by that same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise God. Okay. Kind of what went on in your heart this morning. It's so good to see you. And by the way, I didn't get all the stuff out last week because we ended up at Mayo and all these tests going on, la, 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 la. And so I today, I will give you the links and the notes for last week and this week when I send out my email. So you'll get it this week. Anybody have something that really took off in your heart this morning? I'm looking here and I'm looking there. Yes, please. Oh, there was a lot. Yeah. A whole lot. That's the way back to last week, desert experience. What was that last week? Yeah. And it's like, in those moments that he allows us to be in, in those desert, desert, painful experiences, that we can be convicted and then convinced of his love. And in that love, I felt like, it's like the honeymoon period. Of yeah. We should always be in the honeymoon period with God. We should always want to be feel that love so strongly that it's like you know we'll do anything. Yeah. We'll fix that special thing, you know. Humanly, you know, we do the, those things in that honeymoon period of a relationship. You should always have that going on. Yeah. In relationship. So Kathy's saying, you know, out there in the desert, when we feel isolated, we feel lonely, we feel hungry. All of those things are going on. Those are the moments where Jesus is trying to be then very real to us. He lets us experience that by, well, let's put it this way. A little child begins to learn a lot when they start to play peekaboo, right? In other words, there's a moment where a child needs to know that even though I can't see my mommy or daddy, peekaboo tells me they're still there. Well, guess what God does with us? He plays peekaboo. He gives us those moments. We can't see him, we can't feel him, but he wants us to know he's there. And that will deepen our faith. And I, th I thought Kathy said it really well. We need to stay in that honeymoon part of God, like in a marriage. Too often that honeymoon gets over too quick, right? We need to have that passion that's still there. And even in those dry moments, to know that love is still there, and it's constant, it's strong, it's a foundation. Very good, very good. Anybody else? Steve? I, what got me most, I think, was the look for a reference to the confession. So how many times do you confess the same thing over and over and over again? And then it kind of rears down on you with this voice in your head saying, what's the matter? Yeah. Yeah, Steve's saying it. Too often we find ourselves confessing the same thing over and over and over. And we think, first of all, God doesn't want to hear this again. And sometimes we probably think the priest wasn't here this again. But guess what? If you flunk anger 101 in God, guess what happens? You're not going to get past to the next grade. You're going to take it again. Until what? Anger no longer dominates your life. And you can apply that to anything else. Lust, uh, money, love of money. Excuse me, sloth. Yeah, that's a long story that uh, 
Brian Bird has developed over these past 16 years. Oh, that's another story. Anybody else on Zoom? Jerry, I, something's going through your head. I can see it. Jerry's, Jerry's saying, I don't want to hit this button, but I'm going to. I still can't hear you. Hit that button again, Jerry. There you go. There you How's go. That? Talk to me. Yeah, I'm just thinking that I do, and it sounds like a lot of other people do, just keep beating your head over the same thing. You ask for forgiveness, but then you ask again, and, and you ask again like it didn't happen. So Yeah, I think, think that's, the, that's the other side of that word convict that we don't really understand, and that's convinced. We not only have to be convicted of our sin, somehow we got to be convinced of it so that we can change things, right? Yeah. I mean, if I take away anything from this morning, it really is convict, convince, and then he demonstrates to us what's going to help us get beyond that. If we don't do that, we're stuck. And, and believe me, God still loves you where you're at. But Katie, he loves you too much to leave you there, right? He wants us to grow in the Lord, to find a full maturity in God. There is a destiny in each of our lives. There's a reason you're on this earth, not just to breathe in and breathe out. We have a mission. We have to be about the business of doing that. Amen? Anybody else? Concha. What's on your heart this morning? I saw you say amen, but I thought you might want to say something else. Touch your button there so we can hear you. One more time. Okay, we're going to read your lips and believe it's all. Oh, there you are. Go ahead. Uh, I just like that little chart that you had that said uh, what the devil has and then what. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, that, and I, and you'll get those notes today. That's why I send out the notes. So I appreciate that. It's good to see Florida this morning. Audrey, how are you? Doing good, Tim. Doing good. Very good. All right, we're going to so, have to end. Go, go ahead, say something. I was just going to share real quick um, what the message that I got from it today is. Um, the truth will set you free. Yes. And how the world. The world draws us to think that success and money and all these worldly things get, make us happy, but uh, the devil's a liar, and it's only when we seek that truth in the Lord that sets us truly free. Absolutely. Beautiful. Great way Thank to end you. the class. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to pray one more time in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come to us and convict us and convince us and demonstrate to us our sin. And then, Lord God, lead us to Jesus so we can confess those sins and get beyond them. And we thank you for it and we praise you for it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wave it, everybody. Love you guys. I'll see you next week. I'll get the notes for last weekend, this weekend, the links out to you sometime today. Good to see you all. Love you. You too. Thank you, Tim. God all bless. Right. Bye.